Good morning. This is Wendy Downing, the pastor of the Presbyterian Church in Steelville, Missouri. And I'm sorry that you're not in church this morning to experience the bagpipe playing of Rob Bonus for St. Andrew's Sunday, but I hope you enjoy the liturgy and the celebration of our Kirkin of the Tartans this morning. Let us pray. O oh God, on this day we have come together to worship you. We've come together to make sense of our lives. We look to your word, O oh God, as a source of understanding. Cleanse and enlighten us with your truth. Free us so we can serve you in all that we do. Let us make it our job this day to stand firm in what we believe, for your sake. Amen. Our scripture reading for this morning comes from Mark 1, verses 1 through 8. The beginning of the good news of Jesus Christ, the Son of God. As it is written in the prophet Isaiah, See, I am sending my messenger ahead of you, who will prepare your way. The voice of one crying out in the wilderness, Prepare the way of the Lord, make his path straight. John the baptizer appeared in the wilderness, proclaiming a baptism of repentance for the forgiveness of sins. And people from the whole Judean countryside and all of the people of Jerusalem were going out to him and were baptized by him in the river Jordan, confessing their sins. Now John was clothed with camel's hair, with a leather belt around his waist, and he ate locusts and wild honey. He proclaimed, The one who is more powerful than I is coming after me. I am not worthy to stoop down and untie the thong of his sandals. I have baptized you with water, but he will baptize you with the Holy Spirit. May God add a blessing to the reading of the word. Before she married my dad, my mom was an Eversmeyer. Her dad, my grandpa, grew up in a German orphanage. My dad's family came from England, so that means that only, the only Scottish blood I have flowing through my veins is from my adopted family, the Presbyterian. In the United States, half of those who signed the Declaration of Independence were of Scottish descent. Thirteen governors of the newly created United States were of Scottish descent, as were 11 presidents, half the secretaries of the treasury, and a third of the secretaries of state. It has often been said that without the Scots, there would be no America. And for those who desire a, to boldly proclaim their Scottish heritage, a simple piece of fabric serves as an, the ultimate proclamation. The tartan is an elaborate weaving of colors into a plaid whose look defines one's place in the Scottish world. Each family has a particular tartan that is registered for their use. By wearing the tartan, one is declaring something more than an affinity for plaid. In ancient times, the tartan would tell the world your last name, where you lived, what king your clan served. It is no wonder that over the course of Scottish history, the tartan also gained nearly religious significance. This piece of fabric became a sign of your identity your family, and your faith. The tartan signified what was truly important to you, and in the age when their identity was inseparable from their faith, it told the world what they believed. Despite the reverence shown to it today, there was a time when wearing the tartan was against the law. It's a story of a time of war across Scotland, Ireland, and England when the tartan became a symbol of disobedience. In the tail end of the 1600s, the King of England was the Scottish King James VII of Scotland. In England, he was called James II. James had this one pretty substantial character flaw. James was Roman Catholic in the age of the Reformation. In an age of Protestant and Catholic fighting, between the years 1685 and 1689, King James ruled over England. Yet because of his Catholic faith, he was forced from the throne and sent into exile by his daughter Mary and her husband William of Orange, who was a Dutch prince. The fights for the return to a Catholic throne became known as the Jacobite 
after the Latin word for James, the Jacobite Rebellion in England, and it lasted almost 60 years. In Scotland, it pitted one family against the next, kind of like the American Civil War did for our country. After James' grandson, Bonnie, Bonnie Prince Charlie, made a bid for the throne and was defeated, it became illegal to wear a tartan. The law declared that no man or boy within Scotland will be permitted to wear or put on any item indicating a Highland heritage. This included plaids, kilts, and tartans. Bagpipes were also made illegal. The penalty for a first offense earned you six months in prison, and a second got you immediately deported to the colonies or executed. The legend has it that in the end, the Scots would have none of it. In secret, the seeds of bravery were planted, beginning with only a few at the start and growing in number over time. The angry Scots would sneak a small piece of their tartan into church on Sunday. At a prearranged moment, the families would clutch the tartan and in defiance, the priest would say a blessing out loud. It became a secret blessing to that heritage and that identity that was now forced to be hidden. Eventually, those secret tartans became a little less secret with each passing month, and soon they became outright acts of protest. They became a very loud statement that their faith was not something to be hidden. They became a statement about their refusal to hide their identity away in dark corners or back closets. Their tartans were nothing more than a piece of fabric, but to them was born of courage. The tartan reminded them that faith was risky, and sometimes it required you to stand strong in the face of those who tell you to sit down. Today, the kirking of the tartan is a moment where we are reminded that, as people of faith, we are called to stand up precisely when the world tells us to sit down. It reminds us that being true to our faith doesn't take us to easy and comfortable places. It reminds us that faith requires us picking up a cross that often dumps us into the mud of Calvary. The mental image of men and women under the fear of banishment, risking everything to sneak in a little piece of who they were into church, is a powerful one. I think that this image might help us, <clears throat> excuse me, as people who have, who have it easy to be reminded that when faith is easy, it's not fully expressed or lived out. For this moment and this discussion, I choose to remember a particular story from our scripture, that of John the Baptist. John is an odd bird. He is almost a side freak, a sideshow freak, wearing animal skins and eating bugs at the corner of the desert. But what he was doing was something much more powerful. This one man wading waist deep in the Jordan River was laying a giant smackdown on the religious establishment in a way that was anything but subtle. He was preaching about a broken religious and economic system, and people were listening. To make matters worse, he was offering the fix, a do-over, forgiveness, and a chance at life. The do-overs were the ownership and responsibility of the temple and the religious elite certainly wasn't the responsibility of a half-crazy man. The temple leaders were insulted, and they were outraged. They were even more enraged when they heard of John preaching that someone was coming that would make him look small in comparison. He was talking revolution and rebellion. <clears throat> As happens to most prophets, it was decided that he had to be silenced. In a moment of depravity, his fate was sealed. Very quickly, John was put to death. Shortly after, when Jesus hears of John's death, the scripture details his response in a way that might be lost to most modern readers. We are told in most versions that when Jesus heard of John's death, he withdrew to Galilee. The word withdrew, withdrew seems to come to a connotation of slinking away or retreat. We need to be clear on this. This is not what happened. 
Instead, Jesus, when he hears of John's death, stands up. He stands up and proceeds to head straight to Galilee, <clears throat> the very epicenter of Herod's rule, influence, and control. Jesus basically proceeds basically to walk right into the center of Herod's world and say, See that man that you were so afraid of? That man that you had to kill to keep silent? Well, he warned you of another coming. Well, guess what? I'm here. That is the call of faith that is forgotten in our comfortable worlds. If there is a truth that is perfectly clear in all that we do, it is that faith doesn't take you to comfortable places, but rather the harsh and rocky ones. Faith requires, faith demands that we stand up and in some transformative way <clears throat> be present in the ugliness. The world, may not, the world may tell us to sit down and shut up. But the voice of God that bounces around in our heads and our gut will get louder. Faith demands that we stand face to face with the ugliness, even if we have to travel to the doorstep of a king and knock on his door to do it. <clears throat> How incredible would it be if people of faith stood up and said together, Remember that man or woman you were so afraid of? Guess what? I'm here. Maybe that is part of <clears throat> our coming Advent season that, can, <clears throat> excuse me, that cannot be too quickly glossed over. If Advent is about figuring out how to both respond to God more readily and to live life we are called to, maybe we need to take some time and listen to that call. Maybe we need to ask what small act of defiance we are called to embrace. In the end, truth, the truth remains that each of us has been sneaking in our own little piece of fabric, carrying it around, whether we care to admit it or not. Maybe the little piece of fabric that we hide among our day-to-day -day isn't a tartan, but a reminder of whatever call God has put on our hearts that cannot be silenced or shut off, no matter how uncomfortable it makes us, our family, or the world around us. Here is the simplest rule of our faith. What may start out as a simple, silent, and solitary act of defiance against the way of the world will eventually become world-changing. Maybe the true blessing of the tartan was that something so small so insignificant can remind us to embrace our heritage, to embrace our courage, to stand tall and declare, this I will defend. Amen.